What happened when Israel refused to believe God's promises that he would bring them into the promised land? Now, what will happen to me, a wretch like me, when I refuse to believe that God can save somebody like me? Why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? True or false? Do we at times question God's ability in our lives? Their behavior signed their fate, and it was a terrible fate. Who's to blame in this accident? God or alcohol? You know, our transgressions may have a lifetime consequences. And may God help us to avoid committing sins, the sins of disbelief, in which the consequences may continue for more than one generation. What were some of the sins that so tragically destroyed ancient Israel? Because I've got to study this. I want to get to heaven. And these are warnings for me what to avoid and what not to avoid. Can we learn something from their experience? Remember, God hates sin, but he loves us, the sinners. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, and this is, this is a, a cry of in grief, in pain, how long shall I bear with this evil con congregation who complain against me? I've heard the complaints which the children of Israel make against me. Their cause of complaining? Do you have causes to complain? Say to them, as I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so will I do to you. Question, does God answer my prayers, my negative ones, my positive ones? It's a dangerous thing to pray. The carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in the wilderness. Complaints fall in the wilderness. All of you who are numbered according to your entire number from 20 years old and above, that prayer was answered. They've come all the way from Egypt to the border of the promised land and just to hear what the consequences for their murmurings and unbelief in God would be. Uh, why were the young people exempted from this punishment? Is it possible that the older we become, the more critical we become, the more we complain? God saved more young people than old people. So if you're an old person like me, watch out. Who else were exempted? The Levites, of course. They had no representatives among the spies. And who else? Except for Caleb. Oh, I love this. The son of Jephune and Joshua, the son of Nun. You shall by no means enter the land which I swore I would make you dwell in it. Two people trusted God and they came to Canaan. Were they better than the others? No. They were just as wicked, but they believed what God said. Who else were allowed to see the promised land? Numbers 14, 31. But your little ones, our children always remained little, whom you said would be victims, I will bring in, and they shall know the land which you have despised. Sad words. Now, is there a verse in the Bible that says we should become like children in our, in our trusting of God? You know, my father was the poorest man on earth. I thought he was a millionaire. I trusted him. God wants us to trust him in simplicity like a little, little child trusts his parents.
Aaron's son Eliezer, who was evidently over 30 when he became a priest, also entered the promised land. Few exceptions. But as for you, and God was crying when he says this, said this, your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness. All the moaners. Are you moaning? It's, it's more pleasant to say thank you in life. And your sons shall be shepherds in the wilderness 40 years and bear the brunt of your infidelity until your carcasses are consumed in the wilderness. God wanted them in the land of Canaan, not in the desert. Do you know some of these chronic unhappy people always complaining, telling how bad life and people are? If you are a miserable person, God longs to change you into a pleasant person. It is more pleasant to be pleasant than to be miserable. Please don't let your children suffer because of your gossiping, your fault-finding fault -finding spirit. Why? Why 40 years? This, this is interesting. What was the relationship between a day and a year? Have you ever thought about this? Genesis 40 verse 4 speaks of age. Yom could be age. It could be when, now, a while, full, forevermore, long life. So long as I live can also be translated a year. So Yom, a day, can also be translated as a year. Yom obviously was much more flexible in meaning than is our word today. Yom is a softened form of kom, kom, heat, from the root yacham, to be warm. In common Hebrew usage, yamin days was often used for year. You find this in Exodus 13 verse 10. You shall therefore keep this ordinance in its season from year to year. Now where you read year, in the Hebrew it says yom, to Yom. What does a day have in common with a year? You know, I, I, I found this very fascinating when I did this research. Each day was said to be composed of evening, the dark or the cool part of the day, and morning, the light part or heat of the day. Do we find the cold in the heat phenomenon in the cycle of the year? The Bible is such a fascinating book. Similarly, a year was composed of the cold of winter and the heat of summer. Thus, with respect to their temperature cycles, both the day and the year resembled each other. Two temperatures of a year is compressed in the two temperatures of a single day. While the earth remains, sea time and harvest. Beautiful poetic language. Cold and heat, summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Now what kind of chasm do you notice in this poetic verse? Genesis 8.22. You know you can spend minutes contemplating the beauty of the chasms of the Bible. Sea time and harvest. Which is the cold and which is the warm? Think about it. The next line in the verse gives you the correct answer. You see the Bible in Hebrew parallelism repeats itself and, and make it more clear. Cold and heat. So cold uh, corresponds with sea time and heat harvest. What change do you notice in the next few words? Summer and winter. The year begins with and ends with a what? What would you put in there? The verse ends with day and night. Relationship with the year? Yes. While the earth remains sea time, let's call it A, and harvest B, and Cold, A, and heat, B. 
سما بي الوينتر اي اند داي بي اند نايت اي شال نوت سيز God is consistent. The heat and the cold of the year parallel the heat and cold of the day. We start out with a warm day, we end with a cool evening. So what happens in the year happens in the cycle of one year. According to the number of days in which you spied out the land, 40 days for each day, you shall bear the guilt one year. Namely, 40 years and you shall know my rejection. What are being compared here? According to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, 40 days for each day, you shall bear your guilt one year, namely 40 years. What are being compared here? I love scripture. The spies had spent 40 days searching the land of Canaan and had reported unfavorably on the prospects of occupying it. The results of telling God's people that their God is not able to bring them into the promised land. 40 years longer in the desert. Please believe what God tells you in his word. And don't spend 40 years in the desert of meaninglessness. As a result of this decision, the nation was sentenced to 40 years of suffering in the wilderness. Are you in a wilderness because you disbelieve God? There are so many precious lessons that we learn here. Let's plead with God to give us clean hearts, clean minds. The 40 literal days became 40 prophetic years. One year of wandering about in the desert for each faithless day spent in spying the promised land. You know that this is not an isolated instance of the use of the year day principle in prophecy. It's evident from Ezekiel 4 verse 6 where the same principle is again applied. So if you want to study the year day prophecy, Go back to the book of Genesis. Go back to Sinai. God specifically told Ezekiel, I have appointed thee each day for a year. And in so doing, confirm the principle established in Numbers 14 verse 34. Did Moses had the day year principle in mind when he wrote these beautiful words in Psalms? Listen to what the Psalm says. So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom look at the cycle of one day and get wisdom you know we we rush through days instead of meditating upon the beauty of a single day day a prophecy of daniel 7 yes 1260 days and this this time prophecy occurs seven times in the Bible, in Daniel and Revelation. Cleansing of the sanctuary, year day principle, Daniel 8. We can make a mess in one day, my friend, and it may take a year to clean up the mess. Teach us to number, number our days, Lord. Teach us. It is so important to live. I, the Lord, have spoken this. I will surely do so to all this evil congregation who gather together against me. In this wilderness they shall be consumed, and there they shall die. God wept, and Satan rejoiced. Now when the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land, who returned and made all the congregation complain, against him by bringing a bad report to the land, those very men who brought the evil report about the land died by the plague before the Lord. If there's one thing that God hates, one sin, that is rebellion. And it takes God back to the rebellion of Satan in heaven. Please, don't be a rebel. 
forgive rather than retaliate. Why should we not allow our tongue to utter our dissatisfaction and bitterness? Please, if you struggle with this, guard your tongue, don't speak about it. Deny your self-centeredness. Take up your cross and follow the master. Sometimes we must follow him in self-denial, in pain, but that's the safest way to heaven. The type of plague stroke visited upon the people is not disclosed. It could be like the ten plagues, we don't know. But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jer uh, Jephune, remained alive of the men who went to spy out the land. God always have people that's not complaining. My friend, I want to be one of them. What about you? Don't complain and lose heaven. Here at Kadesh Barnia, a thought came to me uh, where this tragedy happened. Did the rest of the people accept their punishment because what you sow you reap for their rebellion of disbelief? How are we coping with the consequences of sin? You know, you've made a mistake in the past. Your, your name has been stigmatized. How do you cope with it? How can you change this curse into a blessing? You know, consequences of our sins. God wants us to see it as remedial. Warning us not to do the same thing again. He wants us in heaven. Then Moses told these words to all the children of Israel, and the people mourned greatly. Oh, can you see them? Two million of them. Now, question. They mourned. Uh, was this a genuine mourning, or was it a fake? Genuine or pretended sorrow? Well, we have to wait till the next morning to find out whether this was genuine or not genuine. Listen to the sad account. And they rose early in the morning and went up to the top of the mountain, saying, Here we are, and we will go up to the place which the Lord has promised, for we have sinned. Question, are they sorry because they forfeited the privilege to enter the promised land? No. You know, our, sorry, our sorrow, because they trusted God, or was their sorry, their repentance, uh, there because they distrusted God. That was their sin. The consequences has got nothing to do with the sin that we, that we uh, do. I was so privileged to visit this site, Kadesh Barnia. It's so full of history, tears and joy. Did Moses commend them for their willingness to go and conquer the enemies? Visiting the sites near Kadesh, one relives the tragedy of what happened here. Then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who dwelt in the mountain came down and attacked them and drove them back as far as Horma. Now the word Horma, Hebrew, means destruction. If you fight your own battle, you are heading for a Horma, a destruction. God never asks you to fight the battle. The battle is his. You have to trust him. And Israel, God, God was using Israel to punish the heathen nations. Then they did the same sin. Fight only the Lord's battles. When the Lord says fight, deny yourself, do it, but don't fight people. And here we are looking at a typical example of the destruction near Kadesh. If we move without the ark of God's grace and obedience in our hearts, we are heading for destruction. I want to tell you, this is very serious. I agonized with God when I prepared this lecture. And if you and I have a problem, may we agonize with God to gain the victory over bitterness, criticism, jealousy, envy.
And the Amorites who dwelt in, the, in that mountain came out against you and chased you as bees do. Have we been ever attacked by bees? That's a painful experience. And drove you back from Seir to Hormah. This is how Israel was defeated because of their obedience. God said, you don't go up. They said, no, we will. It was a disaster. Don't go against God's will. He's got the best for you in mind. This stone near Kadesh Barnea told me about the many corpses of rebellious Israelites who were strewn all over the desert. The stones were cry out. Then you returned and wept before the Lord, but the Lord would not listen to your voice, nor give ear to you. So you remained in Kadesh many days, according to the days that you spent there. He wanted them in the promised land, and through rebellion and disbelief, they stayed at Kadesh Padia. Are you in a Kadesh Padia right now? Change your unbelief to believe. And let God sanctify your life and help you to enter the heavenly Canaan. I told my friends how the survivors wept because they had to remain in the wilderness. Were they really sorry for the rebellious actions? No. Loretta says, and we travel together and she helps me identifying sites and look after the old man. And she says, because she was on this uh, ex ex excursion, she says, they seemed sincerely, Dad, to repent of their sinful conduct, but they sorrowed because of the result of their evil cause, rather than from a sense of their ingratitude and disobedience. When they found that the Lord did not relent in his decree, their self-will again arose, and they declared that they would not return into the wilderness. In commanding them to leave their enemies alone, God tested their apparent submission and proved that it was not real. You cannot bluff God. You can bluff some people sometime, but you cannot bluff everybody all the time. They knew that they had deeply sinned in allowing their rash feelings to control them in and in seeking to slay the spies who had urged them to obey God. But they were only terrified because they made a fearful mistake, the consequences of which would prove disastrous to themselves. They thought of their own comfort. They did not think about how they hurt God by disbelieving Him. Their hearts were unchanged, and they only needed an excuse to organize a similar outbreak. This happened when Moses, by the authority of God, commanded them to go back into the wilderness. Loretta says that when the Lord told them 40 years later to conquer Jericho, and here we are at Jericho, he promised to be with them. So 40 years later, it was easy to conquer the land. Disbelief is our greatest problem. The are containing his law was born before the enemies. Their appointed leaders were to direct their movements under divine supervision. With such guidance, no harm could come to them. Hmm. But now, contrary to the command of God and the solemn prohibition of their leaders, without the ark and without Moses, they went out to meet the armies of the enemy. You cannot meet the enemy, my friend, without God's presence in your life. Don't attempt to do anything without his help. The trumpet of the rebels sounded an alarm, and Moses hastened after them with a warning. And Moses said, Now why do you transgress the command of the Lord? For this will not succeed. Do not go up lest you be defeated by your enemies, for the Lord is not among you. It is suicidal when we go against God's will, for the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, and you shall fall by the sword, because you have turned away from the Lord. 
the Lord will not be with you. And they still rebelled and did their own thing. Are you a rebel? Please ask the Lord to change your heart. Nevertheless, in their presumption, they went up. They went up toward the highest point in the hill country. Though neither Moses nor the Ark of the Lord's Covenant moved from the camp. Stubborn, what's going to happen here? The Canaanites had heard of the mysterious power that seemed to be guarding this people and of the wonders wrought in their belief. And they now summoned a strong force to repel the invaders. The attacking army had no leader, just a lot of rebels on their own. No prayer was offered that God would give them the victory. They set forth with a desperate purpose to reverse their fate or to die in the battle. Though untrained in war, they were slaves. They were not soldiers. Though untrained in war, they were a vast multitude of armed men and they hoped by a sudden and fierce assault to bear down all opposition. Some of the Canaanite weapons that archaeologists discovered from that time, they presumptuously challenged the foe that had not dared to attack them. Isn't this interesting? Uh, the foe did not provoke them. They just went. The Canaanites had stationed themselves upon a rocky tableland reached only by difficult passes and a steep and dangerous ascent. The immense numbers of the Hebrews could only render their defeat more terrible. And this is what happened. They slowly threaded the mountain paths, exposed to the deadly missiles of the enemies above. Those who reached the summit, exhausted with their ascent, were fiercely repulsed and driven back to great loss. It slowly dawned on me that disobedience could be disastrous. Massive rocks came down, thundering down. Can you hear it? Marking their path with the blood of the slain. And I think Moses looked at this disaster and he wept. And God looked at this. He died for sinners and sinners rejected his counsel. The field of carnage was strewn with the bodies of the dead. The army of Israel was utterly defeated. Destruction and death was the result of that rebellious experiment. Don't experiment with Disobedience, it's disastrous. Forced to submission at last. The survivors returned and wept before the Lord. <laughs> Have you had people saying, sorry, 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 weeping every time they offend you? How did God react? But the Lord would not hearken to their voice. He would not hearken to their voice. By their signal victory, the enemies of Israel were before awaited with trembling. The approach of that mighty host were inspired with confidence to resist them. This was contraproductive. All the reports that they had heard concerning the marvelous things that God had wrought for his people, they now regarded as false. Can't believe them. And they felt that there was no cause for fear. How did their defeat affect their later military confrontations? Negatively. The first defeat of Israel by inspiring the Canaanites with courage and resolution had greatly increased the difficulties of the conquest. We have to gain victory after victory. Otherwise, victories would become more difficult. Are you struggling right now? Ask God to give you the victory. Loretta says, Nothing remained for Israel but to fall back from the face of their victorious foes. 
into the wilderness, knowing that here must be the grave of a whole generation. How sad. This is not God's plan. He wants you in heaven. Don't complain on your way to the promised land. What a very, very sad account of God's people on the borders of the promised land. They could see it and then they moaned. The devil rejoiced and God wept. Are we on the borders of our heavenly Canaan? I think when I look at the world and look at the television, I think we've come to the end of this long, sad history of this rebellious planet. My friend, we cannot afford to miss out on heaven. No, it's too costly. Next to the peaceful, placid Euphrates River, I thought of the following verse. I love the Bible. Oh, that you had heeded my commandments, then your peace would have been like a river and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. Dominus Flevert, when you walk from the summit of Mount of Olives, you can stop halfway and just walk in here. This is where Jesus wept. Why did he weep? He cried out and his frame shook. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. The one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. Can you see him? My friend, this is also a prayer for you and me. He wants you to be saved. He wants you to show the glories of heaven. He wants you to be with him. How often I wanted to gather your children there in the desert all the way back. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. And here God takes the emotions of the female. You know, a female has got some other emotions. God says, I have also feelings uh, female emotions for you, mighty emotions. Why aren't you willing to accept me? See, your house is left to your desolate. God doesn't want us to live in a desolate house. He wants to take us to mansions in heaven. Is there hope for the hopeless sinner like you and me? Is there hope for us? Yes. Return, you backsliding children, and I will heal your backsliding. Indeed, we do come to you, for you are the Lord our God. Now, question. Look at this verse. Who is speaking here? Who is replying? Indeed, we do come. My friend, it is God himself. Why is he speaking like people should speak? Indeed, we come to you for you are the Lord our God. <laughs> you know, God gave them the very words with which they might turn to him. He wrote out the prayer, says, please pray this prayer. In addition to these wonderful pleadings, the Lord gave his erring people the very words with which they might turn to him. They were to say, I am an Israelite in the desert of sin. I'm a rebel, but I want to pray the prayer that God wants me to pray. Listen to God's prayer that he wants us to pray. Indeed, we come to you, for you are the Lord our God. Would you like to pray this very prayer with me? Father in heaven, indeed we come to you, our refuge. 
I'm sorry for my rebellion, my envy and my jealousy. Save me from these destructive emotions and save the viewers who view this program at this moment and save us at last in your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.